coming back yeah. here when it's borderline resectable disease, we do have a few options and this can start to get complicated very quickly. How do you decide which treatment, how you're deciding the number of cycles? Is that dictated by the overall response? Is it by our surgical colleagues? Any role of radiation here? Can you walk us through this space before we switch gears to metastatic disease? Yeah, so thank you for this. This is, a, again, an important practical day-to-day -day question, right? How, What are the best strategies for uh, management of locally advanced pancreas cancer? And I think one uh, key point is the multidisciplinary approach. We like to have our surgery colleagues uh, in close collaboration and often our radiation colleagues uh, to and have a consensus paradigm in terms of how we approach this group of people and remembering that this is a spectrum right from locally advanced which can include uh, to complete vascular encasement as in arterial encasement where there's very unlikely to be any uh, local uh, operative potential to the group of people that have you know, maybe a fairly high chance of going to surgery 60 65 percent in the in the more borderline resectable approach and this can be very very nuanced uh, with more you know potential for operation in in the setting of uh, venous vascular involvement as opposed to extensive arterial involvement. So with, with that, uh, I think first and foremost is the functional status of the individual and their nutrition. So they're more general themes as we, you know, drill down to the individual treatment yeah. regimens. Uh, we have choices, as you were alluding to, with modified fulfirinox and gemcitabine and apaclitaxel and potentially nalirifox uh, too uh, these days, although data there is in the, in the metastatic space. So, you know, mostly for fit younger individuals, it'll be uh, using modified fulfirinox. Um, that's where we have the bulk of the data, but it's a very reasonable approach to use gemcitabine, napaclitaxel, and dose-adjusted strategy, you know, two weeks on, a week off, or even every other week in the older, less fit uh, individual. And, you know, patients' preferences are important here, right? The considerations of ports and frequency of infusion visits and uh, considerations of, uh, you know, alopecia, uh, all of this factors into what might be uh, an optimal decision, but I think, you know, weight in favor of gemcitabine and paclitaxel in the older and less robust population, uh, and certainly strong uh, weighting in the direction of modified fulfirinox for the younger, fitter group of people. And I know, as you alluded to, that uh, modified fulfirinox uh, initially, at least in young fit patients, but sometimes we do see that they won't even respond to modified fulfirinox, where CA199 won't budge too much. And on repeat imaging, at least the scans are not showing progression. Do you usually change your course to gemcitabine, napaclitaxel, and then see the responsiveness based on that? Yeah, I think this is another very important point is when should we make that decision to potentially uh, adjust treatment? And a couple of things that keep I keep in mind as I think about this is at the beginning, at the time of diagnosis, right, this disease can often be biologically very active. It's making people very sick and you know, appetite down, pain down, sugars haywire, etc. It can take some time to just get the cancer under control and get things stabilized. And we all want it to be better yesterday, of course, most of all the person and the family. Uh, but it does take some time. So I'm always a little bit cautious about changing treatment quickly unless it's truly very clear that it's not working. So we use all the clues, right? And the clinical ones are, are, are I think, prime here. Uh, if a patient's pain is getting better, that's a very important positive thing. Mm -hmm. And if they're starting to feel better, and there's nothing subtle about this when it works, right? We see it. It's very gratifying and uh, it's, it's evident to all. Um, but it does take typically you know, sometimes four to six weeks, two to three doses of treatment uh, to, to get in. But if one is reaching the the two-month mark and, and things haven't 
changed and or, you know, CN99 is going up, you know, we can't be naive about it and we certainly have to uh, consider. And increasingly, I think there's comfort with that. And uh, we know biologically, too, this makes sense, right? There's some uh, tumor types or subtypes that can underpin differential response to, to treatment. We need to ideally know this up front, and that's another discussion, but I think increasingly there's going to be some selection um, using these tools to say that this person, apart from their clinical characteristics, is going to be uh, perhaps better suited to receiving X regimen versus, versus Y. We're not quite there yet. Also, just to, to make note is that the CN99 can go up a bit initially, and especially in the metastatic disease setting when people have a very high burden of disease. You know, it can go up quite significantly over the first month. And just always, you know, advise people just to to give it a little time and, uh, and see. And I would say, you know, often, not always, uh, that will bear out. Uh, but yes, I think just careful consideration of all the information at hand, the clinical factors, what the lab trends in terms of tumor marker trajectories, not, you know, individual numbers, but overall trends are telling you. And of course, uh, imaging, and uh, just keeping in mind that imaging can lag a bit, especially at that first assessment point uh, for the, you know, locally advanced and even in the metastatic setting.